Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, Somerset County Library's uh, virtual edition. I'm here with uh, Dr. Ann Gregory from Rutgers University Graduate School of Education. And um, I, I was just talking with, uh, with Ann before about just kind of like the uh, coincidental nature of things happening. I mean, uh, the, this event actually, uh, the idea of it came right the very week that we went into lockdown. I'm not sure if you remember <laughs> that actually. So um, just to think about how that dovetails with, you know, what we're talking about here, um, you know, we've been thinking about just the, the nature, the, the implicit and, you know, subtle ways that racism works in our society in the past, you know, over months, especially in the summer. And I think that this is a topic that really, um, it's important to talk about now, and I'm really glad to have her here to talk about it. You know, as such, such an expert in the topic, and also you know, we're, we're here in the libraries trying to help out educators. Uh, my youth services counterparts are putting a whole s series of things together to um, bring together resources for educators, and I feel like this is you know exactly the kind of thing that I'm glad we're doing now. Um, so again. Um, Later on, uh, I'll be here in the comments. And typically, we um, we go through a presentation, and uh, comment comments and questions can be put into the chat, and we'll address. You know, they're addressed after the presentation. But if anything comes up in the moment, please you know let us know, and I'll keep an eye on that, and uh, we'll address those as it comes up. So, um, well, without further ado, I'll uh, I'll hide myself, and we'll get going. Um, thanks again, everyone, and uh, welcome. Great, thank you so much, Daryl, for the introduction. So as, as, as Daryl mentioned, I am a professor at Rutgers University here uh, in New Brunswick. Um, I teach in the school psychology department and I've been conducting work around racial equity in schools for a, a while now. And I'm really pleased that you, you're making it to six o'clock here on the East Coast um, as, after a long day to have some more screen time. So, so welcome everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen I have a lot of slides to get through. I hope to kind of keep you all engaged in this presentation, uh, perhaps as you're preparing dinner uh, or some such. So let's see, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. And here we go. All right, um, get back to the beginning of my presentation. All right, so today, actually, I have a presentation in three parts for you. And I wanna make it clear that I'm going to be talking about issues of bias, um, explicit and implicit bias in public education, but I'm going to be really working through the lens of school discipline. All right. So this is really my area of work is helping schools move towards racial equity and school discipline. And I have three parts. We're going to get through this together because um, I'll take you on this journey um, through a lot of research. And what I want to emphasize, though, I am a researcher at heart, um, I'll, and I do a lot of work with schools, and I'm a trained clinician, um, but I feel like it's my duty as a state uh, employee really to share uh, some research, to bridge kind of research to practice into the field. So I'm going to be showing you a lot of charts and tables and line graphs, but I don't want that to take away from the urgency of the work. Sometimes when we look at studies, we can think it's kind of cold and distant but I wanna communicate my passion and urgency for this work. So just to kind of back up for a second and say something about myself. So I have a deep drive to address inequality and it, I think a lot of it originates from growing up in the 70s in Brooklyn, a time when racial and economic divides, divides were extremely visible, right? Like you just had to walk several blocks as many of you all know and you could see extreme divides around wealth, around poverty, and also just such diversity, racial and linguistic diversity. So I kind of, that's some seeding some of my work. And when I was in graduate school, I actually volunteered in the evening teaching in San Quentin's men's prison. And given we know so much about the kind of racial mass incarceration that has happened, so many men of color that have been locked up over the decades, and I met so many amazing people that I taught in that prison. And it, it really pointed the profound loss of potential of all these men of color that were in San Quentin. And so what I've done is really committed my work to backing up to thinking about how to disrupt the school to prison pipeline, as it's called, 
and help support schools in keeping students engaged in school, moving towards graduation, and building kind of trusting, uh, culturally competent relationships with educators, especially for students who are disproportionately issued out of school suspension. Okay, so that's just a little about me as some of the entry point of the work. So let me back up, we're, I'm gonna start a little bit, we're gonna go back into the 90s to kind of bring you up to speed on um, some of the work around school discipline. So in the 90s, there was an absolute explosion of the use of suspension and people really attribute it to the Gun Free Schools Act of 1994. And people have heard this term zero tolerance, right? That's used a lot. So in 94, when this passed, there was mandated expulsions for um, firearm offenses. And there was a real what's called mission creep, right? Where schools took the ZT, as we call it in the field, or zero tolerance policies, and started um, using this zero tolerance tolerance approach for many different school discipline infractions, many of which were not, in my perspective, kind of safety threatening necessarily, right? So lots of, if you look at school discipline code, kids could be suspended for extended amount of time for what might be considered more minor infractions. Research, however, started to um, peel back assumptions about suspension as a good intervention. If we think of it as an intervention, like remove the student from school. And we found that if a student was on a negative trajectory, let's say heading towards dropout, a single suspension could increase their risk of, of heading towards dropout, right? So it actually could really make things worse for that student. And there wasn't a lot of evidence that using school suspension actually made schools overall more uh, kind of safe with a more positive climate. I think really what I wanna underscore here is the tremendous amount of evidence that has also shown suspensions, multiple suspensions increase risk for contact with police and the juvenile justice system. And more recent work has, has tied it to uh, the risk for arrest, all right? So, we're, these are very high stakes um, experiences for kids, right? Sending them off into um, a whole different trajectory. So many of us in the field and educators have started to question over decades, why is suspension a go-to? We really need to move away from suspension and how often they're utilized. So there's a big movement to kind of keep kids in school and don't kick them out. There was actually a groundswell of research and advocacy for social and racial justice. And I'll just show you just a few kind of cover reports. Now there was just, you know, they came in one after the other. We had kind of the stolen time report coming out of the New York State. Uh, Monique Morris uh, wrote a book that was has been influential on the criminalization of black girls in school. There was um, compilations of research studies, some of which we commissioned to look at the uh, correlates of school suspension. And this was a bipartisan um, report that came out um, from the state government's justice center that really unpacked um, the link between school and the juvenile justice system and then promoted a lot of different interventions to create a positive school climate and actually prevent the, um, or disrupt, shall we say, the school to prison pipeline. A watershed moment in the field also came in 2014 under the Obama era, what did they call this the Obama era discipline guidance in which the US DOJ and the US DOE underscored the link between racial dis school discipline and racial discrimination. Okay, so schools were really put on notice that if there was disproportionality in their school data, they could be investigated for uh, school dis discrimination, all right? There could be a case of school discrimination. Um, they also issued lots of tools for the field and guidance on how to um, reduce uh, disproportionality. So this was a very big moment in the field. And in fact, it kind of caught up in New Jersey by 2017, um, where there was a new law that went into effect which applied just to K-2 students, so kindergarten to second grade, and it bans out of school suspension, except in extreme cases, um, and it bans expulsions. And I highlighted in red something that jumped at me in the legislation, that it requires student school districts to identify students in pre-K to grade two 
with behavioral problems and provide supports for them. So um, that may seem like a small thing looking from kind of looking back at 2017, but I think it was a really important moment for our state to recognize the need for behavioral supports that kids do need a kind of help in developing different kind of behavioral literacies, so to speak. Um, and it was a real, and, and this New Jersey law, by the way, follows many, many, many other states, Connecticut and California and Colorado, and the list goes on and on that have enacted statewide um, redu uh, recommendations or laws related to reduce the use of suspension. This report came out just last week. So this is fresh off the press, and I wanted to share it with you tonight. So Lowson and Martinez um, used the 2015 and 2016 federal data. So um, every few years, um, school districts issue uh, to, to the federal government. So this is a, a national sample of schools, their school discipline data. And again, this is from 1516, but I want you to notice a couple things that should jump at you when you look at this, this data here. First of all, you'll see the red line. So that's African-American or black students on top. The percentage of African-American students issued one or more out of school suspensions. So first I want you to know the curve, right, goes up and then it starts to head down by 2015, 2016. In my perspective, that's a very good trend meaning that there's been a lot of work on trying to reduce the use of out of school suspension. And some of the data is being, it's being picked up on here, right, in this. But the second thing you should be kind of, you know, woken up, like, check it out. There is just a gaping gap, let's say, between African-American black students and white and Latinx students here on this chart, right? So if you look at the bottom line, you see the white students are depicted through the, um, the dots, the yellow dots, and by 15, 16, 3% of white students were issued out of school suspension in contrast to 13% of black students. So, and, and you can see for uh, Latinx students, 4% by that year were issued out of school suspension. So despite the narrowing of the gap a bit we see over time, there are roads to go. We have many miles to go in this work. And I think here's the urgency of the work. Um, let me, I'm gonna show you another chart. It's much busier, but, but let's take a look at it together. All right, so what we can see first out of, right away, we see black secondary students. That's the top line, the red line with the red triangles. Um, the secondary rates at one point, almost a quarter of black secondary students were issued, a quarter, I wanna underscore that. So to me, there's something really going wrong in schooling, if a quarter of a group are issued one or more school suspensions. But we see there that it is dipping down to 18%, but the gap remains. What I wanted to point out to you was that you can see the gap starting in, in the early grades, however. So black elementary students, you can see here with the rectangles and the red lines, you can see the gap with the um, white elementary students who are yellow, depicted through the yellow lines and the, um, the yellow triangle. So the gap is actually starting in preschool, but then there's a snowballing effect occurring by secondary school. We know that um, dis racial disparities and disciplines start as early as pre-K, which I think is, should um, get us all sitting up in our chairs or wherever we are to think that that's not right, right? That we cannot be setting up these different trajectories so early in schooling around school discipline. Remember, I started today talking about how suspension can have, can really alter life trajectories for kids. And so we need to think, where is this starting? Why, what's contributing? And, and get to work in that area as many, many amazing educators are doing. I also wanna point out though, um, disparities also fall along numerous identity lines. So people in my field call this just a technical term, intersectionality, right? Where students gender, their disability status, their race intersect in ways where multiple forms of oppression or of discrimination can intersect where contexts like school are not serving them well, right? We can see here in this data, 34% of black males with disability that year were issued one or more out of school suspension. 
we see it also high for Latino males and white males. So we see that there's this um, urgency for us to also consider um, how schools are handling um, discipline incidents with kids with disabilities. The story gets more complicated though. There's other groups that are overrepresented and I'm not asking you to read all these um, in-depth texts here, but I just give you a sample study for those of you who kind of want to get into the details here. We know that for African-American females, there can be very high rates of suspensions. There's gender gaps in discipline. Again, starts very early in pre-K. Low income students are consistently overrepresented in school discipline studies. Latinx students, just recently a 2020 study came out using a national sample that, and it, here's just one finding from that study that Latinx students with disabilities were two times more likely to receive a suspension than white students with disabilities and almost three times more likely to be expelled. So again, concerning. Native American youth have been consistently overrepresented in school suspension. And there's a growing body of research showing lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans youth and gender non-conforming youth are also overrepresented in suspension and expulsion. And I can make these slides available to you for those of you who wanna um, look deeper into some of this work. So let me transition now to part two. If I'm uh, keeping your attention here, everybody. So why are racial disparities in school discipline a racial justice issue? So I'm gonna um, break it down for you in how I have thought about this work over time. Now I should say that most of the work in the field has been done examining disparities along the lines of white versus black students. And in fact, my work has also been in that area. But I only am exploring this topic from this area given how much work has been done. But also we have seen over and over and over um, in, in so much work and also in schools, right, that um, African-American and black students are overrepresented in discipline. So I think there's a lot of reason to explore this. And also that we know a lot um, more and more and more about how explicit and implicit racial bias is impacting public education. And so I will break down some of those issues of how I see in discipline um, uh, this playing out. All right, let me start by, I'm gonna get again, all researching on you here. But I do need to point out this study from 2011. It came out of Texas, a statewide study. And it was considered a really a watershed study for so many because people had this notion that it really wasn't about race. It was about social class, right? That disparities were really about social class. And in this was a study in the most rigorous statistical way it was able to pull out the effects of student race on whether they receive discipline or, or not, while accounting for 83 different risk factors for kids who, you know, reasons why that could help explain why they might receive discipline, such as being tr chronically truant, for example, missing school. And this is what they found. They found, this is very statistical language here, but like accounting for 83 different variables, comparing otherwise identical white and Latino students on those different variables, African-American students had a 31% higher likelihood of receiving a school discretionary discipline action. So again, this is a call to arms that's, that, that we need to take seriously the kind of racial dynamics that occur when, um, that can occur in this very complicated process of when students receive discipline. I'm gonna, if you can bear with me, I'm gonna give you one more study. And there are many, many, many studies with similar findings, but I tried to kind of give you some big ones that I can break down for you. Here's another one coming out of Kentucky. The odds a black student was suspended was about two and a half times higher than a white student they found, okay? Then they put into their statistical model, well, maybe the kids are attending different types of school, black versus white students, given we know how much racial segregation occurs in our school system, and when they accounted for these different school contexts, they're still finding that black students were suspended at almost six times the rate as white students. Then they thought, okay, well wait, maybe it has to do with social class or gender or special ed status or family structure. It turns out that even when you put all that into the model, we still see, so I'm talking about a statistical model, 
black students are two and a, close to two and a half times more likely than a white student who is what's called similarly situated um, to receive a school discipline. So I say, I say uh, uh, to receive a suspension, I say all of this, and I hope I'm conveying the urgency of this, that it's pointing to the fact that there are many explanatory factors for racial disparities. We just saw a bunch of them. However, we still cannot ignore the fact that when you account for all these factors, there's still a disproportionality, a kind of harsh disciplining of black students. So let's stay with that. Three of the processes I've written about that contribute to this disproportional uh, disciplining of black students include something I call differential processing, differential selection, and differential access. And I'm gonna go through each of those processes and how I think about those potentially occurring in schools. So the first thing I wanna point out is that we also know so the, the top bullet, the top sentence here should kind of pack a punch in the sense that there's many studies that have accounted for student achievement differences and behavioral differences and still found a black and white disparity in discipline. And there's enough evidence to convincingly say to you today that black students can be issued harsher sanction for behavior, harsher sanctions for behavior similar to white students. So what that means is if you have two students who are sent out of a classroom for a, a perceived misbehavior and sent to an administrator, overall, we can see from many research studies that there's a tendency for black students to be issued harsher sanctions, which might mean long, more days out of school suspension, or maybe the black student receives out of school suspension and the white student uh, receives in school suspension. Now again, for all the educators who are, who are listening here, we know that this is, I am talking about kind of patterns over time where we need to look at this, you know, hard look at, at our system that this is happening um, as a general pattern. Uh, Anne? Yes. I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt, but I just noticed the, um, it's not hiding much, but maybe a citation or two. There's a little bar at the bottom where there you, we go. there, yes. Awesome. Thanks, Daryl. Thank you. I appreciate that you jumped in on that. I thought I was just seeing that. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. So the first the entry point that I had in this work was trying to understand more about where, is, where are these racial disparities occurring in our discipline data? And what became apparent to me in some of my own work and my colleagues' works across the nation is that one particular category of discipline infraction cluster of category often explained the greatest proportion of disparities. This is from a colleague study um, in Virginia and he has found, and many of us have found, that disruption, defiance, insubordination, disrespect is the blockbuster category accounting for most of the racial disparities, um, reasons for referral, um, suspension, something called office discipline referrals for kids getting kicked out of class. It's not typically for something like alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. It's not typically for things like assault and very serious um, kind of safety threatening um, areas. It tends to fall in this domain. And what that's led many of us to do is really try to unpack what is it about this domain, disruption, defiance, disparity, where you, sorry, disruption, defiance, um, disobedience, it's called many things in many different districts. Why is it that there's so much dis uh, disparity black white disparity in this reason for referral. So many of us think about this area as a very subjective discipline category, right? A lot of subjective decision making. First, the educators reading behavior, is this disruptive or not? Um, am I, is that teacher not uh, kind of, let's say we, have, we do have a predominantly white teaching force, to what degree are they skilled at traversing kind of um, cultural and racial divides to build trust or de-escalate in moments that could have kind of simmered down 
There's a lot of different complex racial dynamics that could occur here. Um, Anne Ferguson wrote a text many years ago that struck me in her observational studies in elementary school, where she felt that teachers actually affirmed and elevated expressive modes of the dominant groups and predominantly white boys in her study, but they devalued expressive modes of the African-American boys that she really thought was this kind of lack of cultural competence and honoring of different ways of kind of tone or physical expression. Other scholars like Monique Morris have gone on in her book on push out, focus on black girls. She argues it's a lack of cultural competence in school results in adults negative appraisals of black females who are loud or, or you know, considered having an attitude with quotes. And she argues that these behaviors actually reflect black girls' desires to be heard, seen, and seen in the context of gender and race oppression. And that it's a real mismatch or misread on these behaviors that can lead to kind of escalation and perceptions of attitude and then discipline referrals. So I think this is evocative and something for us to consider about in the, in the field of education. I wanna also drill down into a particular study that many folks in my area talk about that came out in 2016. And it was an interesting study with some disturbing findings that I wanna share with you. They did something called an eye gaze study. So they had the technology to track where teachers would watch in video clips, all right? So that's an important part of this story. So this is what the teachers were told when they went into this experiment. They said, some clips that you watch, dear teacher, may or may not contain challenging behaviors. And then they said that, they said, um, you know, we want you to keep a lookout for a behavior that could become a potential challenge. So unbeknownst to the participants, none of the videos contain challenging behaviors at all. But what they found was convincing evidence that teachers tended to track the behavior of the black students, especially the black boys in these video clips. The, the African-American boys in the clips were under surveillance. They were being watched. And the authors concluded that this vigilance, this attunement to the black boys' behaviors was actually an unconsciously held belief that these black students are more likely to act out. And of course we know if you're looking for something, you can, we can have a confirmation bias, right? Well, I think I'm gonna see this, I'm hypothesizing it, I'm gonna watch for it and I'm going to eventually find it, right? Because I'm gonna keep my eye out for it. Other folks have really talked about this as the notion of racial implicit bias. Um, so I would urge those listening, if you haven't done this already, to participate in, in taking an implicit association test where you can find out in different kinds of domains, it could be body size, it could be race, religion, gender, um, uh, LGBT issues, et cetera. You can kind of choose, choose your own adventure here, find out your own implicit bias. So you can see the link there. And we know from implicit bias studies that, um, for example, um, Goff studies showed that black boys are generally viewed as older, and more culpable than white boys. So when shown photographs, people um, tend to estimate black boys age as older. And they talk about in this article that when you see people as older and more culpable, you're gonna be more punitive towards them. And it's this idea of robbing African-American boys, the kind of um, their age of innocence, this idea that there is room for growth and um, forgiveness, et cetera, if you see kids as older and culpable, you'll respond that way. That's the implication. Another study I present here by Eberhardt, and, and again, there's many, many studies in many fields, um, in, you know, in banking, in job hiring that have shown that implicit bias impacts decision-making. And there's a growing body of work showing that this is occurring in education as well. So in this study, they showed that um, Implicit association tests have demonstrated when black faces were primed, they were more often associated with crime objects than white faces than white faces were. So this kind of linkage, this unconscious linkage or, linkage or implicit association can be held by many, many people, despite the fact that 
many of us, you know, espouse egalitarian beliefs. And by the way, studies have shown that white people tend to hold this more but that African-American adults can hold it too. And people of all races have implicit biases. So the question is, how does that operate in school settings during when you have a fatigued, you know, teaching force working so hard, it's the end of the day, everyone's feeling less emotionally regulated. Could it be that um, in, at, in the afternoons, we know this, that racial gaps in discipline referrals actually get bigger in the afternoons. It might be that teachers have what others call vulnerable decision points in their day, where implicit bias processes can seep in, unbeknownst to them, in their decision making, in terms of um, how they're handling behavior in the classroom or in the hallways. We actually have some research um, that's tried to experiment, experimentally kind of manipulate this a bit. So in this study, teachers were shown an office discipline referral for a student with two incidences of misconduct. They actually varied the name using stereotypically black versus white names, which they had kind of already done some tests to see if people associated kind of a white identity or black identity with these different names, Darnell, Deshaun versus Greg or uh, Jake. And they found after the second infraction, if the student's name was stereotypically black, the teachers indicated the student should be disciplined more severely than if the student name was stereotypically white. They also found teachers were more likely to think the student was black and also that the student, um, they were to label the student as a troublemaker. So I think this is an important study. It's a vignette study, right? So it's, it's a more experimentally manipulated. However, there's more and more studies that are arising like this that cause great concern about, well, what happens in real life? Okay, so now let me move to differential access. So the other thing we know, we have a history of racial inequality in this nation, systemic racism, that have, um, you know, the correlates of which we find this kind of history of unequal access to high quality schooling. We find it pervasive in education today. And the same goes for school discipline. So I'm just gonna share one study I told you I was gonna share a lot of studies. Um, but this has been found, this type of finding has been found again and again and again, it's greatly disturbing. So in this one study I'll give you here, a greater when a school has a greater percentage of black students in the, in the school, the principals in those schools are less likely to report that, they've, um, that they re respond to behavior using restorative approaches to discipline. In fact, as the as the percentage of blacks enrolled black students goes up in many schools, the use of school suspension goes up. And this is even when studies account for the, the percent of students who qualify for free and reduced lunch, for school achievement. Um, so we can see here that there is this kind of differential access, right? Or we can, um, to, to these kind of highly supportive schools, that if, if, an, if a student is in, of any race, that's in a school that has greater percentage of black students, they're more at risk simply from being enrolled in that school. They're more at risk for receiving suspension. So we can think about how explicit racism and um, anti-black racism and um, racial implicit bias can all be at play, but also structural racism, right? We can think about um, how this idea of kind of using social control measures can come into play in predominantly black schools in terms of surveillance and metal detectors and this orientation towards control and less potentially towards support it can occur in our systems writ large in education. So I wanna kind of bring us up to today and I'm gonna to talk about um, what schools are doing nowadays to kind of address this. So, and I wanna underscore the urgency for connection, repair and racial justice today. Daryl kind of alluded to the racial reckoning going on around in our country um, and, the, and, and the kind of reinvigoration of a civil rights movement. And I think all of this fits together that we have um, black and brown communities uh, with the highest kind of mortality and infection rates around COVID. We have um, you know, digital divides for low income communities, less access to high speed internet for high quality uh, remote schooling. Um, 
we have so much trauma and loss going on, anxiety. I mean, so this is the time when we actually, a lot of the issues I touch on today is the urgency for us to kind of pivot our schools towards connection and repair, social and emotional learning, um, and towards racial justice is just underscored as, as these kind of dual pandemics that we're, we're experiencing related to COVID and racism. So what are schools doing? Well, schools are doing a lot in this domain, and I've been happy to be a part of that for the last 15 years. Um, there's really a groundswell of activity. So let's see what sticks over the next decade and if we can keep um, moving in this direction. So there's work around mindset shifts for us to really move away from a punitive mindset related to discipline towards an empathic mindset, um, also towards cultural competence, to um, getting to, um, ex to understand more about our own racial implicit biases and how we can interrupt them in the moment, especially when fatigued. So this one particular study I think is compelling, this idea that teachers can be successfully um, kind of uh, participate in an intervention to increase kind of what I always call radical empathy an empathic mindset of teachers um, taking students' perspectives and developing trust and relationships. So in this particular study, the teachers in, were given an article to read and students' testimony about the power of relationships um, to prevent misconduct. Teachers also read about all the different types of reasons where kids might, from their point of view, um, not conform to the rules, you know, that they might not cooperate. There could be a lot driving it. Then importantly, they asked the teachers to write about their as experts, you know, tell other teachers about what you do to raise the importance of relationships in your room, like to, to really help connect with students. Tell us how you do it. And guess what they found? They found that in the intervention of the teachers who received empathic mindset, they issued that year 50% fewer suspensions than the teachers who were given what they call the kind of comparison intervention. They also found that those teachers in the empathic intervention I described, right, where they're trying to do perspective taking, issue fewer suspension to boys and to African-American and Latino students. So I think that's powerful. We'd have to understand a lot more about, okay, so if you, if you shift towards empathy, what else can the teachers use, you know, to kind of uh, build trust and elicit cooperation? But this alone, I think, is a really evocative study that makes us think about the power of mindsets. Another um, intervention I wanted to actually share a few minutes of a video of, if, if we can get the tech working here, is a, is a free professional development uh, opportunity that I was involved in. It's called Creating Opportunities Through Relationships. And it's fat, you can find it online. It's, three, it's made for K to eighth grade teachers. We have a whole lot of modules that are all about building relationships positive relationships with this idea of preventing um, disengagement, of uh, preventing racial disparities in school discipline. And I wanted to just share, see the little round blue circle that says be aware. I wanna um, share a little bit of that module too, just to give you a flavor of some of the professional development that's out there for teachers to build aware uh, relationships through awareness. So the idea here is to help teachers understand in kind of a non-threatening way that we are not always aware, basically, of some of the beliefs that drive us. They're outside of our awareness. And the notion here is if we can bring some more of our beliefs into awareness, we can actually disrupt harmful beliefs. And here are some of the different domains that we may hold kind of implicitly so let me take a, a few minutes to go ahead and um, share a video, just a snippet uh, of that um, of that intervention. So this is the um, so Daryl. Let me ask: Can you see now the core classrooms video on your screen? Am I sh sharing that correctly? Daryl, you out there? All right, I'm going to assume it's all good unless they hear from Daryl. 
Um, all right, so here we go. I'm going to play this. The core model is a guide for building the strong, positive relationships our students need to thrive. In this module, we'll unpack one element of the model, awareness, and how it impacts our observations, interactions, and ultimately our relationships. The first step to understanding and increasing our awareness is to acknowledge that we all bring beliefs molded by our past experiences into future interactions. It's a natural part of being human. Our brains create these beliefs to help us navigate a complicated world, kind of like mental shortcuts that help us know what to expect and what's expected of us in certain situations. Let's say you walk into a new restaurant for the first time. You have some sense of what will happen and how you're expected to act. This is based on your prior experiences with restaurants you visited, not any particular experience with this specific restaurant or when you meet your new boss. Even though it's the first time you've met, you have a sense that you should act with a level of professionalism that you wouldn't show during a coffee break with a friend. Every time you go to work, have a conversation, play with a child, or meet an old friend, you use beliefs based on prior experiences to help you know how to act and what to expect. But even though it's a natural thing we all do, it's not always a good thing. Sometimes these beliefs stand in the way of us being able to accurately see the world around us. And they can even lead to interactions that harm our relationships. Where it starts to get really tricky is that sometimes we're aware of how our beliefs are affecting us, but sometimes we just aren't. For me, the thought that I may have been holding hidden beliefs that were negatively affecting the way I treated my former students is upsetting. And what makes it even more unnerving is that sometimes these beliefs might have been in conflict with my known values. For example, research shows that many of us associate boys with being more skilled than girls in math and science, and that our actions as teachers reflect this belief. Now that certainly contradicts what I knowingly thought about my students, but chances are I was unintentionally and unknowingly treating the boys and girls differently. So if you're like me, this thought may be upsetting and a bit overwhelming to consider at first. Still, I find comfort in knowing we all have the power to increase our awareness of what some of these beliefs are and how they're affecting us and our relationships. And sometimes just knowing what could be affecting us can propel us to make dramatic improvements in our actions. We know sometimes beliefs can be hard to recognize and overcome. Let's take some time to hear teachers and researchers describe their experiences with harmful beliefs. Then you'll have a chance to react to their stories and reflect on how they relate to your own work with students. So I'm gonna just play uh, one more snippet from this. Um, but I, I wanted to let you know that we created this very, it's interactive, so teachers can reflect and write in responses. But I wanted to play you um, Dr. Fergus talking a little bit about saggy pants, because I think it's compelling. Um, and then some teach some prompts that we integrate for teachers to fill out um, to kind of help them start developing some dialogue with their colleagues around implicit some of the implicit beliefs they might hold. Now we'll hear from Dr. Eddie Fergus as he explains some misperceptions that can come along with how students dress. In this case, they'll talk about how some educators unknowingly make a mental connection between students' fashion expressions and how those expressions represent students' abilities or values. He also talks about what it's like for students to experience these misperceptions at school. After the video, you'll have the opportunity to reflect on what he says. I'm just, you know, I'm just tired of teachers talking about this, you know, the kids sagging their pants. I'm like, yes, I, I get that it may be disruptive for your own psyche, you know, um, in terms of kids sagging their pants, but it's also a representation of how kids are ex expressing their youth culture, you know, the same ways, you know, kids in the 80s wore really baggy pants, you know, and, you know, uh, uh, and, and other sort of generations have done their own fashion things. That have that adults have felt have been disruptive, but the concern becomes how um, expressions like sagging pants have been racialized um, to be, you know, not only sort of for 
um, racialized for black bodies, but also that it's that it signals this idea that they're not valued in education. They, they can't even show up to school looking serious, you know, to come uh, to be educated. What ends up occurring around sort of when the, the perception of, you know, the sagging pants leading to not valuing education is the I'm not going to put as much effort into this kid, you know, um, and uh, and kids are very, you know, cognizant of, you know, who who's really putting, you know, what teachers they are feeling really wants them to do well and is putting a great deal of effort in terms of their own success. Um, and and that, you know, uh, but it all it's all predicated on the, the assumption of that particular aesthetic that the kid is demonstrating is a reflection of that, you know, that you can still have a kid who is sagging his pants that walks into an honest English class um, because that is all that kid is expressing is just a particularized, you know, youth culture uh, of, of how to dress, you know. Uh, it may be not something that us as adults now do, um, uh, but yet we have to recognize that it is a behavior that youth are, are expressing, but it's not um, equal um, a, a, an expression of whether they value education or whether they have any cognitive ability. So the work that has to happen, that's the work that needs to happen before in order to help them be comfortable and recognize I have that link and, and you know, and start constructing a new narrative of, uh, of understanding those sagging pants. It's just sagging pants. So what we do in these modules is then we will ask kind of a question that, that teachers can fill out on their own. Um, we give kind of sample responses that, you know, they can kind of scroll over to see what other teachers have written in. Um, but we have kind of a series of reflective activities for teachers to think about how there may be some kind of belief systems that they hold that they um, have never really surfaced, especially with their colleagues in their school. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. So just um, there's the website, www.coreclassrooms.org. You can sign up and make an account. It's free. You don't get any kind of spam from it. Um, that's really used for just us to track how many people are using this um, to check out more of module two if you're interested in that particular topic. Um, so I'm going to keep going now in my, I have about, I'm going to speak maybe for another 10 minutes. So stay, so bear with me. We're making our way through about 65 slides. Um, I just want to also point out that many districts are engaged in also bringing social emotional learning um, initiatives to their school. This has came out from uh, uh, not long ago, a year or so ago, where the state kind of said, well, here's the five domains and many schools, districts across the nation use these five domains of social and emotional competencies, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, responsible decision-making, relationship skills. And why I have this on the mindset section is because if we're thinking about viewing a behavior and intervening and building trust and also um, behavior as a literacy, then when we see dysregulated behavior in school, we also need to be thinking about what could I do to help work better with this student for my own social and emotional competencies? And what could this student learn in these different domains to help them better succeed in terms of their behavior and wellness in this setting? So do you see the mindset shift? It moves away from a simple kind of punishment orientation and towards an intervention orientation. Yes, we wanna hold students accountable, but we also wanna provide support and learning opportunities in these domains. And in terms of equity, districts are starting to move towards this kind of equity-oriented social-emotional learning, where they're thinking about, of those five skills that I had up before, how can we increase our kind of equity mindset? So for example, social awareness among staff, they could increase perspective taking, empathy, appreciate diversity, and educate themselves from a socio-cultural historical lens understanding more about systemic racism, understanding more about racial trauma, understanding about discrimination. So when incidents come up with students who are describing these experiences, if the educator themselves aren't kind of experiencing it from their own identities, 
they then could understand more where the students are coming from and handle it in a way with greater social awareness of their kids' experiences. Now we also, so that was the kind of mindset category, but we also have the school initiatives to transform policy and practice. There's many, many initiatives, one of which I think is really um, throughout the nation, thousands and thousands of schools are trying to orient their kind of, if you think about their discipline policies, instead of saying, okay, well, this behavior just equals detention and this behavior equals, you know, sent out of the office or call security or suspension, it's an orientation towards, let's think about tiers of supports for behavior. So on tier one, we want to prevent kind of rule infractions and prevent racial disparities from happening, kind of offer, equitably offer different preventive strategies. And tier two would be for kids who are struggling behaviorally. What can we give them? What can we do? What kind of programming do we have? And tier three is for every school will always have kids with serious behavioral struggles, and we do need interventions for them, more intensive interventions at the tier three level for them. So here's just an example of, you know, many districts are kind of throwing the book at it, thinking like, well, let's try all these different uh, approaches, the good behavior game, social emotional learning curricula, something called positive behavior intervention supports. So here's just a sample of one school district and all that they're doing, trying to think more about how they can prevent the kind of racial disparities in discipline and prevent um, uh, excessive use of exclusionary discipline or suspensions and expulsions by kind of meeting kids where they're at, addressing their needs. So I just quickly, um, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about PBIS. I just think it's important to know that it's out and used in many schools. So this is the idea that if teacher, if students have the opportunity to really learn very concretely what the expectations are in school, that um, this will help prevent and provide kind of clarity and reduce kind of subjectivity in terms of um, issuing discipline referrals, especially along racial lines. Like if we can kind of operationalize the behavior in different settings and then teach these to kids. Um, and also there's an emphasis on rewarding positive behavior instead of, um, so I'm gonna go back for a second, this idea that you, you, if teachers see this, reducing reprimands, right? Don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. No, reduce that and increase praise. When you increase praise, you reduce um, and it, you kind of reduce dysregulated behavior, but you also strengthen trust and relationships, right? Because we all respond that way. When teachers are um, speaking to us about our positive behaviors, we'll rise up, we will connect to them, we will kind of meet them where they're at. And when there's an ambiguous situation, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt, that teacher. So it's also a way to kind of build cross-culture and race trusting relationships. So that's this mindset shift a company behavioral shift that there's an emphasis on positive reinforcement. A lot of the work I do is related to restorative practices. Um, and again, it's a, it's a both a mindset and mindset shift and a policy shift. And the idea here is that a restorative approach um, really tries to ferret out what the needs are underneath the behavior and that accountability is not a sole focus on punishment, but a focus on understanding the impact you've had, your behaviors had on someone else, and how to repair the harm. So mostly I'll be giving you some resources if you're interested in restorative practice or restorative justice, and, and many there's so many resources out there, many of which you may know about. But I really do want to point out that there's a, a movement now to be thinking very explicitly about racial equity and racial justice as it interconnects with restorative practice. And I just, these are three texts I think that can, um, if people are interested, will offer some perspectives on that. Again, restorative approaches to discipline have a focus on building relationships, giving voice to the person harm, engaging in a collaborative problem solving process. So think of that from a student agency point of view. It's really trying to honor and understand where the student's experience was in whatever went down in terms of the conflict and really trying collaborative problem solving skills, working together. So instead of just saying, well, your punishment is X, it's like, let's come together and figure out how to repair the harm that's been done. So this is kind of my perspective, part of the uh, transformation of some school discipline processes. I also um, 
there's a standard set of restorative questions that are asked to kind of both the disputant and to the person harmed. I simply share these to say that it's this idea of, again, engaging youth themselves and staff who are in conflict, the people who have been harmed, to step forward to say, well, what happened? You know, how did it impact you? You know, what do you think needs to be done to make things right? This is a very different approach than traditional discipline processes where the person who's been harmed, whether that be a teacher, administrator, a parent or a student is engaged in the process. They have an opportunity to be in this process of, of healing and repairing. And we know there's, and this is part of the research I do, that there's accruing evidence that restorative interventions, restorative initiatives can actually reduce out of school suspension rates. And there's promise, okay? So there's only promise, but it's, it's some promise that restorative initiatives can actually narrow racial disparities in suspension. So we've got a lot more work to do to understand how we can better kind of fulfill the promise of restorative interventions. Um, but, there's, but there's growing work in this area that integrates social emotional learning, racial equity, and restorative practices. And in fact, if you're interested, um, we have uh, my research team at Rutgers University have we put out 12 indicators of restorative practice implementation in which we also talk about how to kind of have equity oriented restorative practices. So that's a resource I'm happy to send anyone if you, if anyone wants to reach out to me. Okay, so it's just about seven o'clock. So y'all who have stayed on have really stuck through um, a lot of PowerPoint slides. I've gone through three parts today, tried to start with a kind of history a little bit of where we're at. I made the case that racial disparities are actually a racial justice issue. We need to be thinking about things like implicit bias, explicit bias, the punitive treatment and criminalization of kids of color and kind of undoing racism. We also need um, to recognize there are a lot of amazing activities going around. And, and I'm hoping that kind of through this pandemic and crisis, we can keep the momentum moving in this direction. Um, and not get set back as we kind of also get hit with fiscal crises as well. But given the absolute paramount, the times that for racial, um, to address racial trauma, to address racial disparities in health outcomes, um, digital divides, that's all happening through this pandemic that have really laid bare the kind of racial inequality and racial fissures in our society. So thank you so much for your attention. My slides, there's my email, my slides are available upon request. I actually have extra slides, but I, I didn't want to go th all through it. It has links to videos on restorative practice, links to a discipline policy if districts like to see that as well. So thank you so much for your attention, and I'll stop sharing screen at this point. Excellent. Thanks so much, Anne. Let's see if I can figure out how to get out of that. All right. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Daryl, were there any questions that have come up? Uh, not in the comments so far. Anyone's welcome to post anything in the comments. Um, uh, I, I've been posting these, uh, you know, in programs as we've been going along. Uh, if anyone wants to take a few minutes to fill out a form, uh, uh, feedback we're collecting during this time. Uh, it's in the link right there. Um, but uh, you know, anyone's welcome to uh, post a question in the in the chat or there is an ask a sec uh, question um, option too, but I'm keeping an eye on both. Otherwise, well, let's wait a few because sometimes people, people take a little bit. Yep, no problem. Yeah, so again, to reiterate, if um, a couple, re you know, some resources, happy to reach out to me if you're interested in learning more about restorative practice implementation. That's something that I'm doing a lot of work around these days. Happy to send you some resources in particular. Great. Well, like I've mentioned, uh, I'm going to try, I'm going to download this and then re, uh, re up it to our YouTube channel. So I'll reach a wider audience and uh, anyone can you know, access it that way. I'm sure a lot of people will. And, uh, you know, this has been very educational. Excellent. Well, thank you all for your attention tonight. Many of you have been Zooming all day, so I appreciate that you Zoomed in one more hour. <laughs> and uh, I, have a, I have a nice evening, and I'm hoping that this is uh, a thought provocative and action-oriented that um, people uh, maybe 
uh, bolstered in their work for racial equity through some of this work. So have a nice night. You too. Very much so. Thank you.